My name is Runar, um, and I'm going to be talking about adjunctions. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I work at a company called Tact, uh, and we um, do purely functional programming in Haskell all day long, uh, and it's amazing. And uh, uh, we're hiring, so if you want to work with me, contact me. Uh, I'm also the author of this book called Functional Programming in Scala, which I wrote with my friend Paul. Uh, and you know, it's great. You should check it out. <clears throat> so the plan is that I'm going to show you this same pattern over and over again, and I'm going to say a junction a bunch, and then you're going to start seeing this pattern around you everywhere, and then you're going to tell me about all the places that you've seen this pattern. All right. Uh, so. Adjunctions. So Saunders MacLean famously said uh, adjoint functors arise everywhere. Uh, the Wikipedia definition for adjunction says that an adjoint functor is a way of giving the most efficient solution to some problem via a method which is formulaic. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful, but uh, dually, uh, so reasoning the other way, we could use an adjunction to find the most difficult problem that a formulaic method solves. Uh, so, to show what adjunctions actually are, it's best to start with an example. Um, and an example in programming that we can all sort of relate to, at least if we're programmers, is um, this, uh, this, uh, this relationships that exist between curried and uncurried functions. So, uh, we can take a, a function that takes a pair a, a, a with b and returns a c, and we can turn it into a curried function that takes the a and returns a partially applied function that then takes the b and returns the c. Uh, so that's curry, and then uncurry goes the other way. That is, if we have a function you know, that we can partially apply like this, we can turn it into a function that takes both arguments at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so this is really an isomorphism, an isomorphism on, on these types, on these uh, functions. So for every uh, uncurried function, we have a curried one, and for every uh, curried function, we have an uncurried one that's, uh, that's exactly equivalent to it. <clears throat> and it's really a relationship between two functors. Uh, so if we take the pair with b idea, and we call that the functor f, uh, and then we take the function from b idea, and we call that a functor g, then really this is a relationship between uh, functions uh, from f of a to c and functions from a to g of c. Right? So for every one on the left, there will be one on the right and vice versa. So it's, a, it's an isomorphism or a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Uh, and we can actually capture this kind of relationship in Haskell. Uh, sorry, there's going to be a lot of Haskell uh, on these slides. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, if we have two functors, f and g, uh, we, can, we can make an adjunction uh, between f and g uh, where we just have to witness this isomorphism, where we can just say, well, we can you know, go one way. If we have a function from f of a to b, we can turn it into a function from a to g of b. And if we have a function from a to g of b, we can turn it into a function from f of a to b. Right? Uh, so, so this has to be an isomorphism, and that's the law. You know, it's not just a good idea, it's the law that uh, this has to be an isomorphism. Right? So if we do go left adjunct and then right adjunct, that should be the identity and, and vice versa. All right? So if we curry and then uncurry, that should, that should, be, that should be an identity. Um, so the example uh, in Haskell that we can write um, as an instance of an adjunction <clears throat> where we have pair with s and function from s, which are witnessed by this isomorphism between curry and uncurry. Um, <clears throat> and you'll notice that the functor on the left is a producer of s's. Or we can think of it as a producer of s's, like it produces an s. And then the right is a consumer of s. Uh, so the producer produces exactly what that function needs. So in, in some sense, it's an optimal answer to the question uh, posed by the function. And in turn, that function is the most difficult question that the producer can answer. Right, so if we uh, pass identity to this 
to the left adjunct, um, we, get a, uh, we get a unit for a monad. Uh, so we, uh, we can go from A to G of F of A if we just pass identity to the left adjunct. And it turns out that the composite functor, GF, is a monad. Um, and if we pass the identity to the right adjunct, taking it uh, across this uh, isomorphism, uh, we get a co-unit for a co-monad, which is really cool. I'm going to explain what that is. Um, but uh, to make an adjunction, we just have to give either the right adjunct and the left adjunct, or the unit and the co-unit. Uh, and we, we can mix and match. We can say, like, we, we can define uh, the unit and the right adjunct, and that's a perfectly good uh, adjunction. <clears throat> so the situation is, is like this. So it's a, a natural isomorphism between arrows um, in categories. So if we have two categories, like this, C and D, uh, then the, the functors, F and G, form an adjunction. Uh, we say that F is left adjoint to G um, if there's an isomorphism on the arrows in this, in this way. So, you know, there's a, an arrow from F of Z to X, then there's uh, an arrow from Z to G of X on the other side in the uh, other category. And in the example with curried and uncurried functions, both of these categories are the category of Haskell types with Haskell functions as the arrows. All right, so... Uh, then the isomorphism is going to look like this between curried and uncurried uh, functions. Okay? Um, so if we pass the identity uh, to our, um, like we, we take the identity sort of across this adjunction. So uh, on the bottom here, if we take the identity and we pass it over to the, to the left, now we get a unit for uh, a monad. And if we take identity and take it to the right, then we get a co-unit for a co-monad. Uh, and in our example, uh, uncurry, sorry, curry identity gives us our unit, and uncurry identity gives us our, uh, our co-unit. All right, so it's pretty easy to see what these do. Uh, so the unit, uh, it takes an A, and it gives us a function from S to uh, pair of uh, A with S. Uh, so it, it, it's sort of obvious what it will do. It will pass the A and the, uh, uh, sorry, it will, uh, it's actually not obvious at all, is it? Uh, <laughs> it will take the A, it will take the S, and it will pair them up, right? Um, and then uh, on the other side, uh, we will uh, have a function from S to B and an S, what we'll do is we'll take that S and we'll pass it to the function to get our B, right? Uh, so uh, people who are, are familiar with, with Haskell and, uh, and purely functional programming in general might be familiar with that, that type signature of S to pair with A and S, right? It might look kind of familiar. This is the state monad, right? So this becomes the unit for the state monad. We can go from A to uh, a state machine that just returns that A and does not actually track any state. Um, but we also get a co-unit for a store co-monad, and I'm going to go into what that is in a bit. All right, so just a refresher on, on state monads. So uh, this models a state machine, a melee machine. Uh, so the, the incoming S into our function is the state before the machine runs, and the outgoming S is the state after the machine runs, um, and then the A is the output of the machine, right? <clears throat> and uh, when we compose these functors the other way, like the function and the pair, we compose them the other way, we get a, this structure called a store. And the way the store works is that uh, we have uh, some S, which is a, sort of our cursor, into an index full of A's, indexed by S's, All right? So, so we have a store full of A's. Each one of them is like under an S. And then we have a, a sort of a current S, just, just like where we are in that space of A's, OK? Um, <clears throat> so then uh, if we, if we F-map our co-units, we sort of turn the crank on our adjunction. 
uh, we get a join for our, our monad. Uh, and I've sort of expanded out the, the state monad into, into the sort of composite, uh, composite functors, functions, and pairs. Uh, so then join will be a nested state machine. Uh, I mean, it will take a nested state machine. So it will take a state machine that returns another state machine. It will pass the input to the first machine. Uh, the output of that machine will be a new state and a new machine. It'll take the output state, pass it into the second machine, and you know that will be uh, the, the final state. Okay, and we can also see the argument as a function that takes an S and returns a store, and that store will model the the nested uh, state machine. Um, okay, so so this thing is a, a monad. Uh, wherever we have this sort of uh, return or, or unit and, and join. Um, so uh, th then we have a monad for, for our functor M. So if we have a return that goes from A to M of A, and a join that goes from M of M of A, so nested M's, to sort of flatten those into one M of A, uh, then we have a monad. And usually in Haskell, uh, we, we write with return and bind. And uh, bind is really sort of... Uh, just map the, the unit followed by join. <clears throat> All right, so we also get a duplicate for our comonet. So that's the sort of the opposite of, of join. Um, so if we have a store full of A's, we can get a store full of stores uh, just by F mapping our, our unit, or taking, taking the unit um, into, uh, into this across the sort of the outermost functor. All right, so, so what does that do? Uh, it, will, it will start with a regular old store full of A's, uh, where we have sort of a current position S. And it will give us uh, a store that's full of stores, where every store at every position is a store uh, with a cursor at that position. All right, so it will allow us to sort of look at the entire space of uh, of all possible positions of the store. <clears throat> uh, and so a comonad uh, is uh, sort of the opposite of, of a monad, where instead of going from A to M of A, we go from uh, our, our comonad W, so for W, A to A, W is sort of an upside down M. Um, and then we have a, a, instead of a join, we have a duplicate, that is we can go from W of A to W of W of A. Uh, and, often, and there's a sort of a cobind, which given a, a W of A uh, and then a function that takes a whole W full of A's and turns that into a B, we can turn, our w, uh, turn that into a W of B's. Uh, and what that's sort of saying, that, that sort of cobind or uh, something called extend, uh, what that's sort of saying is that we can take uh, a computation that operates on some portion of our W uh, and turns it into a B, and we can apply that globally across the whole uh, the context of W. So I'm going to explain that a little bit better. Uh, a comonad, we can say, extends a local computation into a global one. Uh, so we can imagine that this store uh, that we have is a two-dimensional bitmap. So it's a, it's a store full of integers, and it's indexed by, <clears throat> by pairs of integers. All right, so X and Y coordinates. And so we can imagine this being like an infinite bitmap. Uh, then we can write a low-pass filter if we can implement uh, a mean function, which just looks at the sort of the current pixel, the cursor into our image that we're looking at currently, um, and takes the average of the surrounding pixels, like just the immediate neighbors. Uh, and if we extend that over the whole bitmap using our comonet, we get a low-pass filter. That is, we can turn a sharp image into a blurry one. And then we can do this again and take like, the difference between the low-pass filter and, the, uh, and uh, well, the identity and, and extend that over the whole bitmap. And then we get uh, an edge detector. Right? Uh, so it's sort of cool that all of this functionality just kind of falls out of, not, totally naturally falls out of a simple isomorphism between curried and uncurried functions. Anyway, I, I think it's cool. Um, 
<clears throat> so, so that's an example of an adjunction uh, in the category of Haskell types and functions. But uh, most interesting adjunctions arise in other categories, categories other than just the uh, category of Haskell types and functions. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little uh, crash course on, on categories here. So an example of a category is, is Haskell types and functions. So if we have a function f that goes from a to b, we have a function g that goes from b to c, then we have a composite function g dot f that goes from a to c. Uh, and the implementation is, you know, lambda of x, g of f of x. Uh, and composition of functions is associative. That is, uh, we say that this diagram commutes. So, and, and what that means is that it doesn't matter uh, which path we take through this diagram. It doesn't matter if we do f followed by, you know, h composed g. No, sorry, the other way around. h composed g followed by f, or if we do uh, h followed by uh, g composed f. It doesn't matter which which way we uh, put the parentheses, any path, any two paths through this graph from A to C are the same function. Uh, and then for every type, there's an identity function that does nothing. That is, uh, these diagrams commute. We go from, uh, if we have F uh, composed with identity, that's the same as F. And, and in general, a category uh, is like this. It has some objects. It has some arrows between the objects. And it has com a composition of the arrows, which is associative and has identity. And that's, uh, that's all of it. That's all of category theory right there. Um, I don't know what the big deal is, really. Uh, OK, so, uh, so that was the, the category Hask that we just looked at, the, the category of Haskell types, where the arrows are Haskell functions. Composition is just function composition. and. Um, it is associative because it doesn't matter which way you consider the composition. It's always going to be lambda of x, f of g of h of x. That's the composite of f, g, and h in any sort of associate, uh, association. And then uh, the identity function on every type is lambda of x returns x. Uh, but not all categories have functions or even function-like things as arrows. Uh, there's, for example, a, a kind of category called a, a partially ordered set or a poset. Uh, so in a poset, uh, let's imagine that these are the integers. Uh, if we have two integers, uh, a and b, uh, we can say that these are the objects in our category, the integers. And then there's an arrow between a and b exactly when a is less than or equal to b. And then there's an arrow from b to c exactly when uh, b is less than or equal to c. And if that's the case, then we can conclude that a is less than or equal to c. And so there's an arrow from, from uh, a to c as well. And there's an identity arrow on each object because uh, in a post set, every, uh, every object is less than or equal to itself. <clears throat> and uh, composition on the arrows is associative by the transitivity property. That is, it doesn't matter which way we reason here. We can, you know, we can say, well, you know, the, what was it? The, the grandmother of my mother is the mother of my grandmother, right? Um, So, so let's take an example in, in that kind of category of an adjunction. So it's a simple relationship in integer arithmetic. Uh, it's important to know that this is integer arithmetic. Right? So if we know how to multiply integers, th this here is then a specification for integer division. Uh, and it's universal, and it's going to be true for all x, y, and z. So for integers x, y, and z, given that y is greater than 0, I guess I could say natural numbers rather than integers. Um, it's going to be uh, the case that if uh, z times y is less than or equal to x, uh, sorry, z times y is going to be less than or equal to x exactly when z is less than or equal to x divided by y. Um, and we can basically take the, the identity and pass it in here and say, like, well, okay, what if, what if I take Z, divided, uh, Z times Y, and I stick that as my, uh, uh, no, sorry. What if I take the, the uh, identity and I, I you know, put that on one of these sides where, where uh, you know, Z times Y is my X. So I take Z times Y and I put that as the, as the X. What happens on the other side? 
Well, then I get a unit and a co-unit for my junction. So I've, I've taken the identity across this, this junction. So what that's saying is that if I take x, I divide by y, and then I multiply by y again, I'm not going to necessarily get x again. I'm going to get something that is less than or equal to x. Because that division may have had a remainder, which I may have lost. Right? So I divide by y, remainder is gone, I multiply by y again, you know, so something has maybe been lost, so I get something less than or equal to. Uh, and the bottom one says that if we multiply z by y, and then divide by y again, uh, we should get z or greater. Right? So in, in some sense, z times y is the smallest x uh, that we could put uh, in, in, that posi in that x position to make this true. Okay? And this is actually a relationship between two monotone functions. Uh, so, so here, f is uh, multiplication by y, and, and uh, y, uh, sorry, g is division by y. Right? So this is starting to look a lot like the relationship between, between uh, functors. It's starting to look like an adjunction. Uh, and note it, notice that these functions actually are functors. They are endofunctors in the natural numbers as a poset. Um, so the less than or equal to relationship is, uh, is an arrow in that category, and it, can, uh, it, points, from, uh, it points upwards. Right? All right, so <clears throat> let's take a, a different, uh, similar idea and, and consider another one of these adjunctions. So again, I'm just going to give you like a bunch of examples, and hopefully one of them will stick. Um, okay, so let's... Um, let's Consider that this room is our entire universe of discourse. Uh, so then we have, in this room, we have some, some collections of objects. Uh, so we can take objects in this room and we can group them together. Uh, like we can say, those two people over there are a collection. Or uh, like those three seats and, and this person. Like that's a collection. Um, and I'm going to say that there is going to be a poset or there's going to be a, a, a category uh, where there's an arrow between collection one and collection two exactly when collection two contains all of collection one. All right? So this is going to be a, a partially ordered set. And then we're going to have another notion which is going to be an idea of, of sort of conceptualization. Um, so we want uh, these to be sort of descriptions or classifiers or concepts. You can think of these as the sets of attributes or... Uh, you know, in some sense, concepts describing things in the room. Uh, and we want, to ha want those to have a relationship as well, where we say that description one uh, is, is less than or equal to description two, or there's an arrow between them, exactly when description one is more specific than description two. Okay? You know, like, uh, you know, like all the seats in here are made of... of some kind of, I mean, they're brown. And so we can say, you know, seat is, is less specific than brown seat. Okay? So, uh, I'm going to say that we, we're going to have two functions or functors between these two categories uh, that, that go in opposite directions. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the ability to describe a collection. So we have a collection of objects, and we're going to be able to uh, get the, the best fit uh, or the most specific concept that describes that collection. And then we can go the other way. That is, we, if we have a concept, we want to go back to the room and get all of the things in here that are described by that concept. And I want to say that if we uh, take the examples of some, some concept uh, and then we, des we uh, describe them, that is, we get uh, the most specific uh, description, we may end up somewhere that's less than or equal to where we started. Right? So we might, for instance, have uh, person as the description uh, that we start with. And then we say examples, and we get all the people in here. But we, when we describe them again, we might get uh, category theorist, because like, everyone in here is a category theorist. Maybe. Um, and then going the other way, we start with an example uh, e, so a collection of, of objects, and we describe them. 
And we might get something like, uh, you know, we take those two people over there, and we describe them, and we say, per get person. And then we say, well, give me the examples, and we get everybody, right? <clears throat> not the, the uh, people we started with. So it's not, you know, these two functions uh, aren't an isomorphism. They are an adjunction. That is, the description of E is less, is less uh, specific than C exactly when E is uh, a subset of the examples of C. So uh, this is a one-to-one -one relationship between these sort of arrows in these two categories. Uh, uh, we say uh, describe is left adjoint to examples. All right, let's look at another example. Uh, let's use an adjunction in a practical way to solve a simple API design problem. Uh, so we can say, <clears throat> Um, we want to have a function called the index of, which given an equality on A, on the type A, uh, it takes a particular A and we'll find that in a list. So it'll give, an, give us an integer position uh, of that element in the list. But there's a problem because that element may not be in that list at all. Right? So what do we do? So there are lots of ways that people have solved this in the past using ad hoc uh, things. Like you could return negative one, uh, that, you know, that's been done. Uh, you could return infinity or negative infinity or not a number or, or null, uh, which might have a type like for all AA, like it's a value of every type. Um, but what we, what we actually want is we want to return some kind of, uh, some, some kind of special signal. Say, you know, we want to pick out some, uh, some value in our return type that indicates that you know, there's nothing there. And so what we actually want is for a return type to be pointed, um, I want to say. And um, a pointed type is just any type that has a specific point in it. Uh, so for, for example, we could consider the integers to be pointed if we say that negative one is a, a point. Um, OK. So. Knowing nothing else about a particular type, can we turn a type into a pointed type in a formulaic universal way, making no choices, making no ad hoc choices? And it turns out that we can. Because if we have a pointed type, we can get its underlying type using a forgetful functor. That is, we can always go from, from pointed types to types just by, by forgetting the point. So this functor u takes a type x uh, a pointed type x, and it forgets the point, and it gives us the, the regular type. And that turns out to have a left adjoint. Um, and we're going to call that p. <clears throat> and that one is going to go from types to pointed types. So for any given type, it's going to give us a pointed type, uh, which we're going to call p of x. So for any type x, it's going to give us p of x, which is a pointed type. OK, so how is that going to work? Um, Right, so the blue stuff on this slide is uh, pointed types and, and um, functions that preserve the point, or, or pointed type homomorphisms. Um, so the red stuff is ordinary types and functions. Right? So over here on the, on the left, we have pointed type morphisms. And then over on the right, we have uh, a, a regular old function between uh, these things. And I want to say that uh, when we can go from our sort of artificial pointed type p of a to b, uh, that, that we're going to do that exactly when we have a function from a to uh, u of b, which it just forgets the point of b. So we can actually simplify that and say, well, that's actually just the type b. Um, so, so we have, have this situation here. Great. So we can just start turning the crank on our adjunction and say, well, we need a right adjunct <clears throat> and we need a left adjunct. And then we can just see well, what are the types. What do the types need to be? Well, the type of the right adjunct needs to take uh, a regular old function from A to B and turn it into a function from pointed type P of A, which is going to be our, our artificial, the thing that we're looking for, the thing we're trying to find, and turns that into uh, the pointed type B. And you can notice there's a constraint that says the B has to be pointed. Like I have to know some specific. Uh, value of type B that is, is special. Uh, and then the left adjunct says that, well, if I can turn my P of A into B, I can, I can get a function from A to B. 
Okay, great. Um, so we get a, a unit and a co-unit as well, just by keeping turning the crank on our junction. Uh, so the co-unit needs to have the type that it goes from P of B to B, and the unit needs to go from A to P of A uh, for, for all types A. Okay, great. Uh, so we can actually simplify that as well, because like pointed B just means that there is a B. So let's just take a B. All right, so we can simplify it uh, looking like this. So this right adjunct thing is going to start looking, uh, looking a little bit familiar. Uh, if you've worked with uh, Haskell, so given a B and a function from A to B, we have something of A and we can turn it into a B. And that looks a lot like uh, maybe. Uh, and in fact, we can take this right adjunct function here and we can just turn it into a data type like this. Say like, well, new type, this. And now we're done. And this is the answer to how we're going to turn any type into a, into a pointed type. And this is called the this is a free pointed type, which is uh, uh, getting the, the type which is left adjunct to the forgetful functor uh, sort of uh, totally freely. Um, and yeah, it turns out that this type is isomorphic to to maybe. So we have this fold P, which takes a P of A, function from A to B, which is going to be applied if there is an A, and then we have sort of a default P, right? And that's going to be able to uh, give us a B. And that's, in fact, what this maybe function does. Right, it takes a maybe A and, and a B, a default B, and the thing that handles the A inside the maybe, if it's there, uh, and return it into a B. So great. Um, and then our, our uh, unit is going to be just, and our, our co-unit is going to be uh, maybe of the identity. Pretty cool. And, you know, we continue turning the crank, and we get a maybe monad. Uh, and so we get a join, which is just our co-unit. And we actually get a maybe co-monad as well, which is kind of cool. But it's not a co-monad in Hask, or in the Haskell types of functions. Uh, it's a co-monad in the... Uh, uh, pointed types uh, uh, category. Okay, so we just needed a, a pointed type, and the answer to that is well, we just get a free pointed type by uh, asking for what we really want and then taking the left adjoint. <clears throat> so, how to handle uh, nothing here is going to be specified at some later time by uh, the user of our, of our API, right? So we're just gonna return nothing here. All right, uh, another one of these kinds of examples. Uh, so a monoid, a monoid a, uh, a is a type A that is equipped with an associative uh, binary operation and an, a unit for that operation. That is a, uh, an element of A that sort of does nothing when appended to uh, another one on either side. <clears throat> so I want to ask the question, can we turn any type into a monoid in a formulaic universal way, uh, making no ad, cho ad hoc choices that's going to work for every type? Um, and the answer is yes, because we can go from monoids to types using a sort of a forgetful functor. That is, we can just take the, the type which is a monoid and forget that it's a monoid. That's easy. And if we go the other way, we can take any old type and turn it into a monoid, uh, which is going to be called the free monoid, uh, which, which has the property that for any type X, M of X is a monoid, or M is our free monoid. And we can just, like, turn the crank. So right adjunct needs to look something like that. Left adjunct needs to have some type. We have a co-unit and a unit. Uh, the details aren't all that, all that interesting. Is that what's interesting is that we can do this totally mechanically now. But uh, it's cool that we can, we can look at this right adjunct and just basically turn that into a data type. So check that out. This looks familiar to people maybe who have worked with uh, foldables. All right, so given a monoid B, if you can turn an A into a B, I can take an M full of A's and turn them into a B. Right? So uh, that's the interface for foldable. So this is saying that uh, you know, I have, uh, for a foldable T, if I have a T full of A's, I can turn all of them into M's. I can just sum them all together using my monoid and get a single M, right? And if it happens to be empty, I'll get the, the unit, uh, the empty in the monoid. Okay? Um, 
And it turns out that, that this, the canonical example of such a thing is list. So we've just invented lists, right? So how do we you know, take uh, an arbitrary type and turn it into something that we can sort of put together with like an identity element? Well, we just take a list. And so now we can you know, uh, put any two elements sort of next to each other, and we can decide at a later time what that means. Um, so the user of our API is going to decide uh, what, what does it mean for two elements to be next to each other? What, is, what does it mean to, to, uh, to sum them or, or multiply them? <clears throat> so in general, um, if we have this sort of forgetful functor, uh, we're going to have a left adjoint that is, uh, we're going to call free. Uh, and we can repeat the same mechanism over and over again to get things like free monads. Um, we just put monad uh, in, this, in this adjunction. We turn the crank and out pops a data structure that we can use. Um, and forgetful functors also often come with right adjoints. Uh, if we have a functor from co-monads to their underlying functors, we can get a co-free co-monad uh, by asking for the right adjoint. Um, and that's like, totally mechanical and, and awesome. Okay, one more example. So can we get a notion of both A and B uh, that works in any category wh where you know, that kind of notion might make sense uh, and will work universally and systematically for any two A and B, right? The answer is yes, we can. Uh, so we don't have to know anything really about uh, our A's and B's, and we don't really have to know anything about, about C other than we want it to have this notion of both A and B together. Okay, so it turns out that for any categories, uh, any two categories, C and D, we can get a product category, uh, which is called C cross D, where the objects of the product category are pairs of objects. One of them is from C and the other one is from D. And the arrows are pairs of arrows where one of them is from C and the other one is from, from D. And it just so happens that there is a, a functor called the diagonal functor um, that takes uh, category C to the product category of C with itself. And the way it operates on objects is that given an object C, it will just uh, return C with itself. Uh, and given a, 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 a morphism, a, an arrow F, it will pair up F with itself. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, so we don't not, not know what our product is going to be, but this uh, there's an adjunction that can give it to us. So it turns out that this delta functor has a right adjoint. And we can just say, <clears throat> uh, what is it? And here's a complete specification for our product. Right? <clears throat> we, can all, we can all go home now. Right, so uh, <clears throat> what this here is saying is that uh, whenever there's an arrow from delta of A to B and C, that, it, and that double arrow is an arrow in the product category, uh, Whenever there's such an arrow, uh, there's going to be an arrow from A to uh, product of B and C. I'm going to call that pi, pi of B and C. <clears throat> and we can actually simplify this because uh, delta of A is just uh, A with A. So this is saying that there's an arrow from A with A to B with C. And remember, that arrow, that double arrow, is actually two arrows, one from A to B and the other one from B to C. Um, and then exactly when we have one of those, we're going to have one from A to product of B and C. Okay, so I'm actually going to rename that to B cross C, so just to, to make it nicer to look at. And I'm also going to expand out the uh, left-hand side so we're working in, in one category here. So this is actually a, a pair of sorts. I'm kind of just going to wave my hand and, and say that that works, but we, we want to think of it as a pair of, of two arrows like this. Okay. So whenever we have an arrow from A to B and an arrow from A to C, we're going to have an arrow from A to B cross C, whatever that is. We don't know what a B cross C is going to be. And this is, again, a specification for our product. <clears throat> so if we just stick the identity on either side here, uh, like the, the identity arrow on either side, where, where on the left-hand side we, have, we need two identities together, uh, then we get a, a unit and a co-unit. And the co-unit is going to look like that. It's going to go from B cross C to B, 
and from B cross C to C. That is, given our product, we're going to be able to project out the components of the product, the B and the C. We'll be able to get, get at them. All right? <clears throat> so what this is actually saying is that the, it's a specification for the product, B cross C. And it's saying that B cross C is an object such that uh, for all uh, A uh, that have arrows into B cross C, if there's an arrow from, from uh, A to B and an arrow from A to C, uh, no, sorry, if there's an arrow from A to B and an arrow from A to C, there is going to be an arrow from A to B cross C, and vice versa, right? So uh, it's like, if we look at it as a commutative diagram, it's saying the situation like, like this. And to the, you know, the category theorists, uh, this is going to look very familiar. This is a product uh, diagram. So this is saying that there are projections pi 1 and pi 2 that get at our B and our C from our product uh, B cross C. And then for all A that have uh, arrows into both B and C, there's going to be an arrow, a unique arrow from, from A uh, into B cross C. So great. Um, so what, what falls out of this in Hask uh, is going to be the tuple type. That is the Cartesian product of two types. And our projections are going to be first and second. So these two things together are going to be our co-unit. And the unit is just going to take a type A and pair it with, and, and uh, get, uh, give us a pair A with A. <clears throat> uh, but in a different category, like if we consider something other than Hask, uh, we might get something totally different. Like we don't necessarily know uh, what that's going to be. Um, so if we consider uh, POSET, for, in for instance, um, so this is saying that the product of B and C in a POSET is going to be some object, B cross C, that is going to be above uh, every object A that is below both B and C, right? So it's, it's uh, yeah. So we can, we can look at the co unit and the co-unit for that, and it's going to say, well, B cross C is going to be below both B and C. Uh, so it's going to be a lower bound for them. But the, upper, the top thing is saying it's going to be the greatest such bound. Right? So uh, it's going to be the, the greatest lower bound. Is that right? Is so the least upper bound? All right. Doesn't matter because we can, if we turn all the arrows around, we get the other one. We get the, uh, the least, uh, we ha on, one, on one of them we have the least upper bound and the other one we have the greatest lower bound. Uh, I get my lefts and my rights confused all the time. Uh, so, so yeah, if we turn uh, the, all the arrows around, we get a co-product, uh, which is the, the sort of the dual notion. Um, and that's going to be our uh, right adjoint to that delta functor. So in general, uh, least upper bounds are going to be left adjoint, and greatest lower bounds are going to be right adjoint. Uh, and uh, yeah. And in the hash code category, our coproduct is going to be either. So the product is going to be pair, and our coproduct is going to be either. Um, so sums are generally left adjoint to diagonals, which are right adjoint to products. Um, and another cool and awesome thing is that we can use this fact to do generic uh, programming. Uh, I mean, we can use adjunctions to, to, to do generic programming. So uh, adjunctions compose. And so if you have an adjunction, uh, if f is less left adjoint to g and p is left adjoint to q, then fp is going to be left adjoint to gq. Uh, and it's generally enough to know only half of this adjunction. So if we know, uh, I think if we know any two of F, P, G, and Q, uh, we can find the others, uh, sort of automatically. And there's an awesome uh, couple of papers about this. Uh, one of them is called Generic Programming with Adjunctions, uh, which you know, uh, generates programs uh, using specifications which are, which are functors and finds their uh, adjoints. And there's another one called Galculator, Functional Prototype of a Galois Connection-Based Proof Assistant uh, by uh, Paulo Silva and uh, Jose Oliveira. And 
so, so Galois connection is another word for a junction. It's an adjunction in a, uh, in a poset. Um, anyway, I encourage you to check out those papers. They're awesome. Um, so in the end, what, what are junctions really about? Like, what do they really mean? Uh, so we can say sort of that uh, an adjunction generates a solution that naturally fits a problem. Uh, we can say that an adjunction resolves tensions between trade-offs by basically not having to make any decisions. We just generate a solution or generate a problem if we have the solution. Uh, it will, I, I want to say it will find an optimal surface between a problem space and a solution space. That is, it will find sort of where these, where these things uh, meet in a, uh, in, in a junction. Um, we can also say that we can use it to compare two categories uh, or simulate one category in another. Um, so we want to, to look at, you know, how, how do we talk about one category in terms of another? Uh, that's what, what adjunctions are, are doing. Anyway, it's all very sort of hand wavy, but hopefully it gives you some kind of intuition for what this is sort of about. Um, so anyway, um, let's, uh, let's look for, for adjunctions whenever we want to generate solutions that sort of naturally fit our problems. Um, and <clears throat> we just express our problem as a, as a functor, and we find its adjoint, and then we've, we've solved our, our problem in a, a general, natural, and elegant way. So uh, adjunctions are everywhere, and I encourage you to to look for them. Thank you.